and welcome back to another episode of History Now. Today we're looking at the Irish language in the United States in the 19th century and joining me today is Par Gia O'Mahuna, whose new book, Recovering an Irish Voice from the American Frontier, the prose writings of Owen O'Cahill, is here with me, remotely of course. Parag, you're very welcome to the show. Thanks, Barry. Parag, I have your new book here and I've been reading it over the last week. It's really, really fascinating. Um, perhaps people won't be familiar with who Owen O'Cahill was. So can you start off by giving us a bit of background on who he was and then maybe just tell us how you came across him? Yeah, so Owen O'Cahill, he, he definitely wouldn't be a household name even in, in Irish language literature. Um, but he was from Temple Glendon in County Limerick and he was born around 1840. Um, and he emigrates over to the U.S. in 1863. And, you know, even a, a cursory glance at history will tell you that's the, the height of the American Civil War that he lands into the U.S. Um, and, you know, during that summer um, that he arrives, we see the major battles of Gettysburg, the Siege of Vicksburg, uh, the Battle of Chickamauga, and, of course, the infamous kind of New York City draft riots. Um, but O'Cahill doesn't actually follow the kind of loads of his countrymen into the ranks of the U.S. military. Instead, he hastens to, to Washington, D.C., uh, where a childhood friend actually gives him a job. Um, James L. Roach is his name, and he's from Temple Glenton as well. But he gives him a job working in the Quartermaster General's Department. Um, and he's supplying uh, barracks and quarters and overseeing the transportation of military uh, personnel and supplies. Um, and he does this for a couple of years, and then he lives a fairly regular life um, as an Irish immigrant in, in the United States. Um, he serves in the Chicago Police Department for a few years in the 1870s, and then he spends the remainder of his life in Pentwater, Michigan, or as he calls it, he puts he gives it a, a Gaelic uh, place name or you know log on him Gaelic, um, Ishka Glasta, and it kind of reflects the original place name of it being of the place of penned up or locked up water, um, and he spends the remainder of his life there pretty much, and he operates a pub for about 20 years. Um, and then he also works as a, as a farmer. Uh, he has a, a barber shop for a period of time, which ends in disaster when the whole of Main Street or nearly the whole of Main Street in Pentwater burns down. And then he works as well as a timber surveyor in the kind of booming lumber trade of the, of the upper Midwest. Um, and I suppose that, you know, might beg the question then, why is he important if he's just kind of a, a run of the mill kind of regular um, Irish immigrant? But uh, he went to the effort of writing a number of stories in Irish, uh, which he purported were his his kind of, I suppose, his autobiography um, of time spent in the U.S. military and also working in the lumber trade. Um, what we know and what I'm sure we'll discuss a bit today now and through the book um, has kind of, I suppose, shed a light on the fact that he was embellishing quite a bit about what he was doing. Um, so if we're looking at him in today's terms, we might say that he'd be busted for stolen valor of uh, saying that he was in the U.S. military and that he had quite a large role, a military role. Um, but we know that that's actually not the case. So how did you come across him? Because I know you're, you have a kind of connected research area. Did you come across him by chance? Somewhat by chance, yeah. I mean, I saw a passing reference to his poetry, actually. So he wrote these kind of epic poems as well, which aren't contained in this volume, um, which, I mean, they're a couple hundred stanzas, um, and they're kind of in oceanic verse that he's he's writing these. But I saw a reference to the poems in a book by the, the great late um, Kenneth Nielsen, um, great Irish language scholar. And he mentioned that O'Cahill had written these, just specifically the poems about his time in the U.S. Cavalry. Uh, so that, of course, piqued my interest, and I suppose I was drawn to his unpublished kind of manuscripts, which are housed in the National Library of Ireland and in NUI Galway as well. Um, and I suppose when I started looking through what's contained, they're actually in the Douglas Hyde papers, um, I saw that the prose writings were actually probably more fascinating than the poetry um, in, in a lot of senses, um, both linguistically and in terms of the, the topics as well. Um, and then I through really a stroke of luck because I, I got a Fulbright fellowship to, to kind of translate the works. But just um, one Saturday afternoon, I happened to, you know, kind of be at, a, be at a loss as to some of the claims he was making in these works. And I was trying to 
I actually contacted Damien Shales, great you know scholar on the American Civil War, and said, "Look, I can't find this guy anywhere in the military roles. Can you, you know, take a look as well?" And he couldn't find him. He asked a couple of friends; they couldn't find him. So I figured, if you want to find something out about you know a person in rural Ireland, where do you start? And I figured the, the local parish uh, is usually a good a good point. So I just messaged the local Temple Glenton Facebook page and said, look, I'm wondering, is there anybody in the parish with this surname? And have you heard of, you know, this character who went out to the U.S.? And da, 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 da. And within about a half an hour, I had a response from the secretary. And she said, you know, as luck would have it, I'm really good friends with his, like, great, 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 great granddaughter. And, you know, here's her contact details. <laughs> so that started a whole new journey. And she put me in touch with her cousins out in the U.S. And in particular, one cousin, Mary Turnus, who's out in California, was just a, a treasure trove of knowledge. And she had personal papers of Owen O'Cahill as well. So I was able to kind of turn the work from just a, a work of translation into really a social history uh, of, you know, where this kind of delineation between fact and fiction uh, and between man and myth really came about in his writings. Is it, you know, is he taking on, you know, aspects of the Irish folklore tradition and, you know, imposing them on his own life? Yeah, in, in, in a lot of senses, um, I suppose dime novel authors themselves were famous for kind of embellishing their backgrounds and uh, in a lot of instances obscuring their identity. So people that study kind of dime novels in the U.S., there's often kind of that trouble that you'll go down a rabbit hole and then you kind of, you know, fall into a dead end because they purposely obscured their identities. So for a lot of them, like O'Cahill, um, this included kind of these bloated claims of military service. And um, a lot of times this was kind of accompanied by dubious military titles like colonel or captain, uh, et cetera. But they actually weren't earned in the military. They were more kind of honorary titles um, to lend authority to their tales and kind of lend credence to these stories that they're telling about the Plains Indian Wars or even the American Civil War or whatever it might have been. Um, but... I would say that O'Cahill is certainly kind of um, tapping into the Irish folklore tradition as well. And we see this in a few kind of, you know, outright ways um, in, in, in terms of, you know, he says that all of the stories happened, or all the stories are true. There's a couple of para paratexts within, within the book. And he kind of says, all of these are true exactly as they happened to me or to the people who I heard them from. Um, and we know that he was a pub owner for 20 years. So, I mean, he probably did hear quite a few um, great stories over, over his time. But he does talk about growing up in Temple Glenton in some of his kind of recollections. And he says that, you know, he would have grown up by the firesides where neighbors would have come and they would have their repertoire of stories. And they would, you know, kind of go from house to house and, you know, tell a story from the repertoire and whatnot about kind of local people or about something that happened themselves. So we see that kind of trickle through as well. It's kind of a marrying of the two traditions of, you know, the American dime novel and this kind of Irish folk tradition. But in terms of, I suppose, as I say, more kind of direct links to the Irish folk tradition, he actually mentions Ihan the Guihamora, the, the kind of Night of the Big Wind, which is something that we see in the folklore archive mentioned. And he just says in passing about one of the Irish figures uh, in one of the stories, oh yeah, and he told me that he was in Roscommon on the night of Ian the Guillemora, and you know this is what he was doing on that night. So it, we can kind of see that that that's it wasn't really relevant to the story, but it's just an inclusion that he throws in. And then, as well as that, I suppose his invocation of the Fionn cycle of Fionn the and the Fianna uh, is really fascinating, because one thing that's kind of said about the American West, um, kind of in general, but, you know, particularly these kind of dime novel feats that we see, is that it was ordinary people doing extraordinary things or thrown into extraordinary circumstances. Um, so that's, I mean, the base of the genre, really. Um, but in O'Cahill's case, and this is something that we see, he's very specifically catering for an Irish audience and an Irish language audience, is that he uses kind of allusions to Fionn McCool and the Fianna to describe these extraordinary circumstances in some cases. Um, so for example, in one story, he recalls killing what he thinks are about 400 wolves, uh, shooting out of his uh, cabin window one evening from his kitchen table. And he says, you know, 
Oshin or Dermot or Oscar never looked on as many corpses on a battlefield as I did that night of these wolves. <laughs> and I mean, clearly that was not the case. And, you know, he was embellishing there, but it's, it's interesting that he frames it within, because at that time we have to remember that he's, he's writing for an Irish audience, but the film, the, I suppose the stories of Fionn McCool and the Fianna were very much alive within the folk tradition and within the oral history, kind of the oral tradition within our rural Ireland at that time. So to make that reference to describe these things that, you know, the people probably couldn't picture, or, you know, thought, okay, this is obviously uh, him embellishing, you know, was a great contextualization, really a bicultural product um, that he's, that he's attempting to kind of, I suppose, you know, in a revolutionary sense, you know, kind of, create this bicultural literature of the American West. What led him to use the Irish language as a medium for telling stories in America? I suppose it's one of the fascinating kind of facts about Okaho is that, you know, we have millions of Irish speakers emigrate to the United States in, in the 19th century, but very few actually leave accounts of their lives there. Um, so that was one of the things that I really tried to stress throughout the book, and particularly even in the, the introduction, is kind of piece together his linguistic background and answer that question of why he decided to write in Irish. Um, and I suppose part of that was ideological. Um, Owen O'Cahill presents us with definitely a multilingual America. Um, he has a passion not only for the Irish language, but I suppose a passion to see every immigrant group uh, kind of maintain their linguistic backgrounds and their kind of ancestral tongues. And it's not until he actually comes to the U.S. that he develops that passion for the Irish language. But he says when he comes to the United States, he saw every, every ethnic group in the U.S. speaking in their, in their native tongue, except for the Irish and the Scandinavians. And then he said that a kind of, um, I suppose, an embarrassment came on him that he called himself an Irishman and was proud to be an Irishman, but he couldn't speak Irish. And one of the really interesting things in the book, um, which I've included, is to that aim, he actually included a dictionary uh, for his intended readership of uh, specific region-specific terms, historically specific terms to the United States, and then also general terms as well. Um, so even he, in one stage, and this is kind of some of his bluff uh, of you know his military career, he says that he was one of the soldiers, he was amongst the troop that was sent out to avenge the death of uh, General Custer after the Little Bighorn. And he actually galicizes that event as an Arak Bjog Moor uh, for literally the Little Big Horn. So we see that in this dictionary, and there's a load of other kind of uh, historically specific terms as well. Can you tell us a bit about how he viewed Native Americans? Yeah, it's, his, his views are very complex on Native Americans. And I suppose in terms of the approach to the stories in general, just to preface that, I would say, you know, there's a... There's a a great quote from the historian Jay Randolph Cox, who studies kind of dime novels, and he talks about the the value of dime novels to you know audiences today. And he says that it's not so much in literary value that we should kind of treasure these works, but actually as pieces of social history, um, and that they encapsulate a view of the United States roughly from 1860 to 1915, um, and the political views, the social views. Um, and even, I suppose, to, to a degree, the religious views of people in the United States around that time. And O'Cahill is no different, and obviously he's, you know, fascinating linguistically as well. Um, so his depictions of Native Americans, I think, have to be seen through that lens, in that he very much was a man of his time. And I suppose his stories can be kind of divided up into two uh, into two kind of genres, so to speak. So the first three do depict these kind of fierce encounters with Native Americans on the plains. And these would be typical of dime novels around the 1860s, early 1860s, or mid 1860s into the 1870s. Um, figures like Buffalo Bill Cody, where it was, you know, the value in how many Indians you killed. And, you know, these figures were held up and revered. Um, but I think we have to see these as pieces of entertainment, you know, in the United, a time that the United States was expanding across um, the Trans-Mississippi West. And so they're very much pieces of entertainment for settler, you know, that reflect the center, settler colonial mindset of the population at the time. Um, and O'Cahill is no different. But 
then we see in his later stories that are set up in the upper Midwest, a kind of shift where by the turn of the 20th century, the late 19th century, Indians are no longer this kind of, um, you know, group to be feared, uh, but they're his hunting partners, his kind of friends that he meets down at the shop. And in one case, there's a sympathetic story towards, uh, it's called him Frank Luck Auerach, or the Lucky Frenchman. Um, and a Frenchman leaves after some unfortunate circumstances and some love trouble, but I won't give any spoiler alerts away there. Um, he actually says, I, I turn my back on my own race forever and goes and lives with a Native American tribe at a reservation in, um, in Illinois. And it's interesting because one would look at that story and say, oh, okay, yep, that was, you know, this kind of sympathetic view of Native Americans. And it is true to a degree, but then there's also kind of this, I suppose, reinforcement of a settler kind of dichotomy where it's kind of advanced outsiders going in to educate the kind of simplistic natives. Um, and that's certainly what happens in that story. Um, but putting that, you know, those themes that he shows in those stories against the backdrop of what was happening in the U.S. at that time, we, I suppose, see that after the United States comes out of the, um, the American Civil War, there's this kind of worldview that emerges where it's, you know, seen as kind of republicanism and democracy, you know, in the flying in the face of aristocracies and monarchies on a, on a global scale. And there's this effort to, you know, kind of go and abolitionize the world and republicanize the world, establish free labor republics, democratic republics all around. And that's even, you know, the outbreak of the 10 years war in Cuba in 1868. There's a kind of widespread support for the Cubans um, throughout the United States at that time. And they want the U.S. government under President Ulysses S. Grant to intervene. Um, and their di major disappointment when they don't. But what's actually happening in the background, though, there's not kind of an, an acknowledgement. And there is at least now there's great kind of historical um, scholarship coming out on this and has been coming out for the past 10 years on the fact that that was really the beginning of uh, the Imperial Republic. And the U.S. at the time was an Imperial Republic. And it was kind of um, some historians have claimed that the Trans-Mississippi West was a training ground uh, for the Imperial Republic and the occupied South as well. Uh, and then by the turn of the 20th century, then we've kind of moved beyond the borders into, again, they do intervene in Cuba then, but in a very different tone than these early idealists of the 1860s would like, and in the Philippines as well. Um, and the treatment of indigenous peoples in the American West very much mirrors U.S. policy towards the, the Tagalog people or the, the native people of the Philippines. Um, so folks like Okaho would have very much kind of been in that mindset of not only supporting in the 1860s uh, kind of U.S. colonialism along the plains, but also supporting when, you, when the U.S. comes into its own as an imperial power at the turn of the 20th century, supporting those ventures as well. So with, with his, you know, um, Irish language stories, he strikes up a friendship with, you know, one of the leading lights of the Irish cultural revival in Ireland, and that's Douglas Hyde. So can we talk just a bit about that relationship between those two? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating because that relationship uh, between Hyde and Ikahal is very much shrouded in mystery, even, you know, even after the amount of research I've done on them. Um, you know, he is at various times described, even by members of Owen Akaho's family, as one of his best friends, um, you know, a dear friend, and even then ranging down to just a contact. Um, and it's tough to pinpoint actually where that friendship came about, because as we know, you know, Hyde had his well-publicized tour of the U.S. At the, at the turn of the 20th century, and that's another book that was actually translated, or his diaries, um, of his his travels across across the U.S. was done a few years ago, a couple of years ago, I think, by UCD Press. Um, but there's no mention that he he made his way to like the likes of uh, Temple Glen in Michigan. Um, and even when he was in Chicago, Owen Okaho is not one of the people that he mentions that he had come across at that time. Um, my best guess of the kind of origin of their friendship was actually Owen Okaho had a they had a mutual friend i suppose in um 
a priest called Owen O'Carroll, um, who was the, the pastor of St. Thomas Church in Chicago. And he was kind of a famous figure around Chicago because he used to have an Irish language mass every year. Um, and he actually used to, he bought himself an Irish language typeset and he would print out his sermons in Irish and then give a really kind of base uh, or coarse uh, translation, literal translation into English as well. And he would invite Irish speakers from around the area to come to this mass and then they would have a big banquet afterwards as well. And Owen O'Cahill in one of his stories mentions that he, he attended one of these masses, he got the invite and then in a different letter he says that he owed um, Father Owen because he put him in touch with the Irish speakers in Dublin, meaning the Gaelic Leaguers in Dublin at that time, uh, and that was what saved Don O'Cahill's Irish because there was a lack of opportunities for him to, to kind of correspond with people in Irish. So my best bet is that that's where he actually came into contact with Douglas Hyde at first. And, you know, knowing Hyde um, a few years before his trip to America, he was actually a visiting professor uh, in Canada, um, on the northeast coast of Canada. And he went out and kind of took folklore down, took stories down from local members of the Maliseet Nation, uh, the First Nations tribe. Um, so he had an interest anyway in the kind of comparison between Irish stories and Native American stories. And so, you know, if I, th I think if he got an inkling that Owen O'Cahill had written these or that he was, you know, kind of thinking of writing them, Hyde would have told him to send them on, and that's exactly what he did. Uh, so he you know, sent all of his manuscripts on to Hyde and he was hoping that they were going to get published and Douglas Hyde actually writes to Charlotte uh, Cahill, uh, who's Owen's daughter, youngest daughter, um, after he dies and says, look, you know, I tried to get him printed because she writes, starts corresponding with Hyde as well. And he says, I tried to get your father's manuscripts published with Arm Doom, uh, but they, they failed peer review basically. Um, I haven't found any evidence of that in the Angum archive because I went and looked and saw, you know, if there was any kind of correspondence about these, but there wasn't. Um, but he says that it was just based on idiom. There was too much idiom in the stories and based on the kind, you know, kind of to the, the dialect as well, that it wasn't in line with the Irish that they wanted it in the 1925 when they, when they found it on Goom. Um, so yeah, they keep up a, a lengthy correspondence though throughout and there's a few of those letters in the, in the text. So do you think now that, you know, this is available, you have, you've translated, I should say about the format of the book, the Irish is in there as well as the English translation, which you've done. Do you think that now that given the time period that he's writing that at the turn of the, uh, the century, his connections with the Irish language rev revival in Ireland, do you think that offers us a, a sort of fresh perspective on the cultural revival, given that it's coming from outside of Ireland? Yeah, I would say it does. I mean, it's interesting because in some respects, Owen O'Call fits into, um, you know, kind of tropes from, from the American writers of the revival. Uh, for example, there's one letter in there that he wrote back to in Cleve Solish. And within that, it's kind of an anti-emigration letter. Uh, and he describes, it's still valuable because he does give some of his, you know, own biographical information um within that and he also kind of describes you know uh, the environment of the midwest and the far west and you know kind of but in a sense that he's telling irish immigrants not to emigrate because you know it's so harsh that they won't survive and you know they won't have a good life there and everything else but that's very common uh we even see some irish language writers you know from springfield massachusetts or hartford connecticut where i'm from or anywhere else who were also writing back to Uncleve Solish around that time. And it was a very much coordinated campaign begun by the activists in Dublin to try to stop the language shift and stop people from emigrating, to have these American-based writers, you know, coming in saying, it's, look, we live here, but it's horrendous. You wouldn't like it stay in Ireland. Uh, so he, he does kind of fit in in that sense in that one letter. But then elsewhere, as I mentioned, you know, he does give us a new perspective in so much as, um, you know, even he, his kind of love of languages isn't relegated to Irish. So he gives us this kind of view of a, a multilingual United States um, and, 
even in one instance, he's talking about French, the French language, and he's talking with a, a French immigrant, and you know they're talking in French, and he has this little dialogue about the importance of keeping up your language, and you know that they have to keep speaking French, or it'll eventually fade away. And we can obviously deduce that he is talking about Irish there, but he does it in very creative ways. Um, and I think just his story in general, um, you know, being a non-native speaker, as you say, uh, who emigrates over to the U.S appreciates the importance of the Irish language abroad and then is kind of coming back uh, towards, you know, towards the movement at home and kind of contributing from afar is definitely a valuable insight to have. Um, one aspect on that, though, is that he didn't always, he wasn't always on the same page as the movement at home uh, and the individuals in the movement at home. For example, on the Spanish-American War and the kind of emergence of American imperialism one of the letters in the in the book is actually a fiery kind of editorial that he's challenging uh, the editor of Enclave Solish about their views and their condemnation of American imperialism. And this is probably a, a nerdy kind of linguistic point, but one thing I always notice when he's writing back to Ireland is that he always uses the um, first, he uses the third person plural uh, to describe those back in Ireland. He doesn't you know, even as an Irish born person, he doesn't say, oh yeah, we're doing this. He says, yous back in Ireland don't understand, da 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 da. Um, so it shows that kind of bicultural identity that he had um, by, you know, I suppose after 30 or 40 years in the US. And, well, we're talking about, you know, the, the language revival. You actually launched the book uh, a week or two ago in the heart of the, the language revival in Belfast up in the Culture Land. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so we launched the book um, a couple of weeks ago, and yeah, we had Martin O'Millior, um, who I suppose a long campaigner for language rights here in Belfast, uh, launched the book, and probably couldn't have been a better person to launch the text in terms of Martin's work over the past number of years with Irish America, and I think you know as somebody who kind of keeps a foot in both worlds to to some extent, I can see that Martin is really a champion of both cultures and kind of bringing together what's going on here on the ground with what's going on in places, you know, everywhere from New York to probably New Mexico. Uh, he has contacts in Irish America and really seems to understand the importance of that kind of relationship, um, that historical relationship that we have. Uh, and, you know, that people like Owen Akaho really kind of exemplify. Um, and there was a number of other people there. I suppose I was, it, it was quite a day in terms of, um, as you mentioned, the, the language revival in, in Belfast. You know, um, I wasn't sure who was going to actually show up just because, you know, it's COVID times and, you know, we have to wear our masks and everything else. But, um, you know, Seamus McShawn, Owen O'Neill, Gary Jacarillon, Jeremy O'Bruider, Fergal McUnrichty, um, you know, people who were and still are really central to the language revival here in Belfast turned out and to kind of show their support. And, um, yeah, it was just, I was taken aback. People that I, I think the world of uh, linguistically and just personally. Um, yeah, so it was a great, great occasion. Yeah. So, Paul, here it is. Recovering an Irish voice from, an American, from the American frontier. Can you tell our viewers where they can find the book? Yeah, so the book is available um, here in Belfast and on Kahru Poli, uh, so um, you can be in touch with Anya Nick Geralt there. Um, and there's actually commemorative bookmarks available for free uh, with the book if purchased there. But it's also online at Waterstones, Amazon, or direct from the publishers at the University of North Texas Press. Uh, so maybe we can put the link in the description uh, to UNT Press as well. Okay. Parag, thanks very much for joining me. I'm, I'm really, it's a really fascinating, like you say, it's a, it's, it's a real fascinating snapshot in time, you know, in, in America, but of course it has those Irish echoes as well. So thanks very much for coming on and speaking to me about it. Yeah, thank you, Barry.